nature of this meeting, the nature of this lecture today is to con continuation of video orbits, which will be our next lab. We've, everybody's pretty well uh, got the other labs underway. So now we'll, for the last, last lab, give a little bit of a time extension. So now we're jumping into orbits. And this is chapter six of the textbook. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say a few fun words. Um, we got that conference coming up on March 30th, Water, Humans, and Technology. And this is something that uh, affects us all, you know, quality of water and everything like that and everything we live on. And the world's first cyborgs were the world the world's first cyborgs were on vessels you know manfred klein says his favorite example of a cyborg is a person riding a bicycle and if we say that a person riding a bicycle is a cyborg then a person on a vessel is also a cyborg and the world's first cyborgs were more than a million years ago were people on vessels so a vessel is the natural extension of the human mind and body that predates many of the other technologies. The invention of vessels is older than the invention of clothing. It's older than the invention of the wheel. It's been around longer than the wheel, longer than clothing, longer than computers, longer than bicycles. And so that was the world's first cyborg was someone on a vessel. So we were kind of playing around a little bit with uh, traditional cyborg technologies like um, a raft or something. So we're just having some fun uh, with these, this, this traditional idea of a vessel. And uh, so for example, yesterday, we just had a little bit of fun paddling around here on this piece of ice. And so this is a vessel and we're paddling the vessel. And so this is kind of like a little exploration and early cyborg technologies going back to million year old technologies of makeshift vessels, naturally occurring vessels. See, in ancient times, people would have found a log or a piece of wood to, that floats and float along on that. And that was perhaps in human civilization, the first example, the earliest example of cyborg technology. I'll share my screen for a second. And so this conference that we're having on the 30th is in that spirit. And if any of you want to join and participate in the conference, um, that would be lots of fun. And let me tame that down a little bit so you can see it. and switch that into picture in picture on. So I've got my the upper right hand corner. I've got that video feed there. So yeah, this is, this, this here is a, a little vessel on the vessel. So one of the things I did my master's thesis on was the chirplet transform for detecting iceberg fragments. This is a little radar set that I built many years ago with it. And the radar here will see iceberg fragments that are too small to show up on conventional radar. I built the first system that could detect and see these, uh, these growlers, they're called. They make growling noises from the, when the ice melts and liberates trapped bubbles. They make a growling sound that sounds like an animal. So these pieces of ice are called growlers. And uh, an iceberg is quite visible on a radar. You can see an iceberg and avoid hitting it. Since the sinking of the Titanic, we've had a lot of attention has been paid to not being able to image and see iceberg fragments and not smash into them. But these growlers are too small to show up on radar, and yet they damage ice. The growlers that, that you uh, can't see on radar or like like the one that I that we were paddling on yesterday, something that size will do quite a bit of damage to a ship, but it's completely invisible to radar before the invention of the triplet transform. 
So we this this work is, is an early example of water HCI. So this is a radar for picking up marine radar for seeing iceberg fragments. And what we do is uh, a couple of days ago we had this on one of the ice fragments and we're paddling on another and we're doing some fun with imaging it. This is connected to a multimeter and the multimeter is connected to a Raspberry Pi. Um, so we've upgraded this since I built it in the 1980s. We've kind of modernized it a little bit. And now the way it works is that this multimeter measures, picks up the output of the radar set and that feeds into the Pi, which is wirelessly communicated back to the base station. And this little piece here, I've got these cool noodles attached to it so it doesn't sink if it falls in. In this case, it's waterproof and sealed and watertight so it doesn't damage the radar set if it falls off. You always got to think about safety. If you fall off, you want to have the right suit, the right equipment. And for landing in ice water, if you've got a long swim back, um, we're doing research. And so that's kind of a fun thing. Just, this is a little side note, anyway, a fun little side note. And I, I also ordered a, a nice paddle, a new paddle. So this is an unboxing of a new paddle. And we'll, I'll be going today around four o'clock if anyone wants to join. And uh, so the idea is to make a smart paddle that has sensors in it. So that's that's what we're going to try and do is make a smart, smart sensing paddle. And put sensing technology, radar, sonar, and other sensors into this smart paddle. So we're going to combine a million year old tradition, technology that's more than a million years old, with something new in the technological universe. And so if we look at this new piece of technology and how we can actually extend it into the cyborg era. So here it is the paddle. And Paddles are quite advanced. This is made out of carbon fiber, so it's nice and light. The front end of it is made out of nylon. This is the actual paddle end. But these pipes here are made out of carbon fiber, so these are carbon fiber pipes. And they join together. Like this, you push this little button here, and these little pieces join together. So there's one segment of the pipe, and here's two more segments of the pipe, and there, there's a little string that holds them together so they don't get lost from each other, and there's a little opening here like this, and you just put that one inside this one. goes in here and it all folds up really small and fits into a backpack that comes in five sections here and then we can we can put some radar um, and see what the radar cross section of carbon fiber is so that's the other thing we're going to want to do is look at carbon fiber in terms of this radar cross section and then this little lever here it's quite advanced. It, you push it down here and it holds. It's got a little cable in it that tightens and grabs on there. It's called a lever lock. And uh, it's got a US patent number on it. So this is quite an advanced technology. And then what we have is this punch away from printing machine, which we put in or on the paddle. And that has power supply red and black and then these four wires here are the uh, data and clock are separate and power for that as well same thing with this end power plus data and clock separated and what that makes 
this able to do is to transmit data really quickly so we can quickly update it and make it like a psilocybrograph that plots out phenomenological quantities about the ice and the Doppler returns from the iceberg fragments. This is an underwater enclosure. Uh, it's got a clear top so that you can see all the instrumentation in here. So there's instrumentation that goes inside this and you can see through the lid. So we can put all those instruments in here, put that on the ice, have that floating along and then actually see in there while we're paddling, we can look in and see the data that we're collecting. So that's a really fun thing. So if anybody's interested in joining that, we're gonna go today at four o'clock and if anyone wants to co-author some, some of this piece or work on the writing, that would be a lot of fun too. So now, let me come back over here. Push back the main camera and open her up again a little bit. So yeah, that's uh, that's a little aside. That's a fun little project we're working on. Anyone wants to join on that? Let me share my screen now and just go through a little bit of this. Now you'll see some feedback, obviously, the first time around here. Now, what I've got here is chapter six of the textbook. What I want to talk about a little bit. And so just as you go through chapter six, video orbits. That's the general idea, video orbits. So this is kind of the, the fundamental principle is that when we look at things as periodic patterns, and in this case, it's chirping, and you can see that, that pattern at low frequencies at the left, increasing at the right. Now, if we plot that domain versus range, remember we had the tangent of the arc tangent function if you recall, we had tan of arc tan in the orbits. Here we had x2 equals z2 tan of arc tan of x1 over z1 minus theta for all theta not equal to O1. The singularity in the origin uh, is called the appearing point, and that's the point that map that never maps from the the point in the domain that never maps to the range. And if we look here, z two and z one are constants across the whole image. X one is and x two are variables, so x one is the domain, x two is the range of that mapping. The, it, we could just say y equals z two tan arc tan of x over z one minus theta use x for the domain and y for the range. But when we expand to two dimensional images, we often use x, y for the range. So I might say x1, y1 in the, in the, in the domain and x2, y2 in, in, the, in, in the range, for example, or more likely I'll just say x, y pairs. So I'll have x, y pairs I'll have x, y pairs in the domain, x1, y1, and in the range, we'll have x2, y2. So what we see here is this trigonometric identity here, a trigonometric relationship, shall we say, can be simplified greatly, we saw yesterday, into something of the form ax plus b over cx plus 1, or more generally, as we'll see, we want to end up with ax plus b over cx plus d because there's a singular point there that one single point that causes trouble and we need to take that into account as well. But let's go back here to that graph. I want everybody to understand that plot there. This is the domain coordinate and this is the range coordinate over here. And you can see if we draw a graph of that function y equals ax plus b over cx plus 1. What we get is something that looks like this. 
it kind of looks like a rectangular hyperbola. And the amount of chirpiness is, is, in, is sort of expresses itself as how tight this rectangular hyperbola pulls in towards the center. And you see points in the domain get mapped into the range. And if we have periodic structures in the domain, they map to chirps in the range. And there's a point at which the spatial frequency increases without bound. Uh, frequency increases, but the wavelength decreases. When something decreases to zero, we say it vanishes. So there's a point right here in the middle of all that mass at y equals two or x2 equals two at which the spatial frequency increases without bound as we approach this asymptote. This asymptote at y equals two is never reached, but as we get closer and closer to it, the frequency increases and the wavelength decreases. The wavelength goes to zero or vanishes at that point. And so we call this the vanishing point because it's the point at which the wavelength vanishes or goes to zero. Now in the domain, there's another uh, asymptote and this asymptote appears at the value negative one in the domain where x equals minus one or x one equals minus one. And in the domain, that point in the domain never gets to the range. Nothing in that point ever maps to the range. And I made up a word for that or a phrase, a, 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 a conceptualization. And uh, conceptualization is here that that in the in the domain, I call that the appearing point kind of a term I made up for this opposite of vanishing point. I could call that the exploding point or the appearing point or something like that, where it blows up, where the function blows up instead of compresses. Now, this age, day and age of terrorism, hysteria, everything, I almost rather call it the appearing point than the exploding point. Now, if we look, uh, so I kind of want to give everybody a conceptual understanding of this. And so let me just pull this across here. And I wrote a little article here in the MIT Arts Journal. It's basically an April Fool's joke, April 1st, 1994. And I kind of made fun of the idea of a newspaper. And the title of the article is The Appearing Point, and it's a little article about what is the appearing point. I was very much inspired when I saw an artist. On the left here, you see an artist standing in front of an easel making a painting of the railway tracks. Over here on the right, you see the MIT nuclear reactor. I lived right across the street from the reactor building at Edgerton House. and. Here that we see the set of railway tracks and the artist painting the railway tracks. And we could identify a point where the railway tracks meet. There's two philosophies that are competing. One says parallel lines never meet. If you're a traditional geometrist, of course, people don't teach geometry anymore. It's too simple. Nowadays, mathematics has become more advanced. But in the old days, people used to learn uh, Euclidean geometry and projective geometry and stuff like that. And people would say that parallel lines never meet if they were a Euclidean thinker. But if you're a projection, let's call a projectionist or somebody who believes in projective geometry, you will say parallel lines meet at the point at infinity. So we look at this and we say those parallel railway tracks meet at this point right here. And you can actually see, you could actually point to a place on that near the middle of that page where those parallel lines meet. If you take a, a, a ruler and a, pen, and a pencil, you could continue those lines right to that point, even that, though the length of that railway track is finite and it might not meet, but you could continue that 
to that specific point. And then if we look at what the railway tracks are made of, they're made out of wood and stones and wood and stones, and it repeats. There's these wooden railway ties and between them there's gravel stones. So if you look at this, you could got wood stone, wood stone, wood stone alternating. And from the bottom, if we start going upwards, the wood and the stone get closer and closer together as we move from the bottom of the picture towards the top of the picture. Wood stone, wood stone, wood so it goes wood, stone, wood stone, wood stone, wood stone, and faster and faster and faster as you go up, and that's called a chirp. If you made an audio recording of a column going down the center of that image and played it up through your loudspeakers and started playing from the bottom upwards, it might sound like I start out at low frequencies and the frequency would increase without bound as we approach the vanishing point. So now I've drawn here a nice little drawing that shows what we're seeing here. I drew a camera. The camera is mounted in such a way that it's shooting straight ahead, meaning that the camera is, the back of the camera is straight perpendicular to the ground, straight up and down. This hole represents either the pinhole of the camera or it could represent a lens and the aperture through the lens and it would then represent the center of projection of the lens, which is at the center of the iris of the lens. And here I've drawn rays that trace. Uh, you can either think in a modern way that the rays of light come from the railway tracks back into the image plane or you can think as the ancient Greeks did with extra missive theory, that rays of something travel from the film plane out and touch the tracks. Either way, there's a line that connects this railway tie to the image of this railway tie and the second railway tie to the image of the railway tie and the third one and the fourth one and so on. And you can see each time I move from left to right, the railway ties are equally spaced, but the image of the railway ties is getting closer and closer together. I've labeled the vanishing point VP. V stands for vanishing and P stands for point. And so if we look at that, and I, here I explain that chirp signals are often used in radar and so on. Now, if I take a picture of a picture, I take a photograph of that photograph or otherwise apply algebraic projective geometry to that photograph and do an algebraic projective coordinate transformation. What I see now is the vanishing point appears in the frame on the page and so does the appearing point. Here in this picture the appearing point is directly below the center of projection of the lens of the camera. So if you dropped a line straight from the pinhole to the ground, the appearing point is on the ground. And that is a point that never maps to the image. No matter how wide angle of a lens you have, that's the point that will never map to the image plane. And you can see the appearing point labeled AP. If you trace a ray of light from that appearing point through the center of projection of the camera lens, it never meets the image plane because it is parallel to the image plane. Or if you prefer, you could say it meets the image plane at the point at infinity. And what's really nice about this transformation here in the second picture is that you can see both the vanishing point and the appearing point upon this page. So the appearing point uh, is where I'm standing. It's basically right underneath the camera lens. And of course, the image ends before we get to it. Now, if I choose just the right coordinate transformation, this is a very special coordinate transformation. Imagine a camera laying on its back, looking straight up into the sky, such that the image plane is parallel to the railway tracks. And this camera is perpendicular to the other camera. And imagine it takes a picture of the second camera. And we can do this computationally through algebraic projective geometry, that we have a mapping from the railway tracks to the image. 
and VP is the vanishing point. And then we have that second camera looking, but what we get. So here's the result. What we see here is that the railway tracks have become parallel in the image. And moreover, we see the spacing between the wood and the stones has become equal. Wood stones, wood stones, wood stones, uniformly and equally spaced. As we go down the page, the coordinate transformation is more extreme. And as a result, the image is blurrier or fuzzier because it's stretched or magnified the distant objects. And so as those things are magnified, it's pushing the limits of what we can see, but we can still see those railway tracks going straight ahead. There's a second set of rail tracks that swerves off a little bit to one side, but the main set of tracks goes straight down. And you can see the artist here on the right-hand side of the page, that easel is stretched out in crazy proportions. If I go back to that earlier image, you can see the artist here on the right-hand side. You can see the, certainly see the easel and the canvas and the artist's hat there. If you look at that very first image, the artist was wearing a little white hat here and you can see the easel quite visible. And you can see right here, you can still see that white hat from the artist and the easel. And if you look over here, you really have to use your imagination, but you can make out that easel there that the artist is sketching upon. So this is de-chirping. This is called de-chirping an image. And that's what a lot of these ideas are, are, are founded on the idea of, of de-chirping. Finally, uh, I'm doing this, uh, here's a newspaper. And here's a coordinate transformation of the newspaper that puts the appearing point right in the center of the page. So here the appearing point is towards the edge of the image. But if I make the appearing point fall right in the center of the image, this is what I get. So here's a picture of a picture. Now this is a mathematically theoretical picture because to really get this, if we look at our second camera here, the second camera, we have to imagine also that rays of light can go out through the back of that camera. It's a mathematically perfect projection where rays of light can come in either through the front of the camera or through the back of the camera. And it's simply, as we said, a mathematical transformation. And here is a photograph of the New York Times front page, uh, which has been taken in such a way that the appearing point is in the center of the page. You can see at the bottom it says the and then n in and times over on the right there. Here's another example where the appearing point is somewhere else, not the center of the page. All the news that's fit to print in the upper left hand side, that's just in the corner of the New York Times. We have that in the upper left hand corner. You can see that in the corner right right there and the in this page, you can see all the news that's fit to print. Is a little slogan in the upper left-hand corner of the page, and then that is looking off at the rest of the paper. So I think that if you if you look at that appearing point, and you can, I'll just cut and paste that URL into the chat. Let me end my screen share and put this into the chat. So I will put that appearing point article into the, the Jitsi chat and, and take a look at that and read it through and kind of understand it and enjoy it. Now let me switch back to my chalkboard with live picture and picture. So now I've just got the right there. And we'll just gain this camera down a little bit so that you can still see it.
then let me just finish up with a little bit of an introduction into some of what's in chapter six, which I'm assuming that you're going to read chapter six in detail, but I just want to give you a little bit of a heads up start here. So chapter six, one of the things in chapter six is this featureless estimation of, of parameters to relate to images together. So if you have two pictures as the same subject matter, and you know you have one picture where there's something in that image over here, and maybe another picture where the same subject matter is over here in this picture. What we want to do is know the core of the transformation between these two. Like if I put this here in blue, say where this was, I just overlay those two images. So this one from two here, just to distinguish. And then I say, well, how much, how much distance, say delta x, to move subject matter and how much distance, delta y to that move. Now, typically, uh, the image does other things. The transformation does other things. It doesn't just translate, but it does other things. And so let's say, for simplicity, it just translated, because we just want to consider the simplest possible case to understand the concepts. And then once you understand the concepts, then, you can, then we can go more advanced. We can try and, uh, and understand something a little bit deeper and more you know, true to what it is. So for, we'll further simplify it by considering a one-dimensional image. So in this case, we've got an image that's only a function of x, one dimension. And we'll consider that there's something here at, at time t equals zero, let's say. And then let's say this is the x-axis and that object moved over here at time t equals, say, t1, maybe t0 or something. Now, so you've got these two different points in time, and the object just, let's suppose it just moved over from one image to the other, because that's the simplest example to consider. Now, typically, in, 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 in we consider uh, the space-time continuum. You know, we often talk about the space-time continuum, where we got x, y, z, and then at another point in time, we have the world as it is x, y, z. And this is at time t0, and this is at time t1. And so the world changes to some degree. Maybe there's in three-dimensional space an object over here, and then, and then it's over here. And then maybe that object is moving, or our camera's moving there's relative movement between our camera and the object or whatever the case may be because something appears here and it appears over here now uh, we we could often plot this as a four-dimensional sort of x y z t y z another axis t or something and we can draw that in a four-dimensional space but it's difficult to draw four-dimensional spaces on a two-dimensional chalkboard so what I've done is I've made a kind of simplified version of the world to drop down. If we only consider two-dimensional image processing, we can say, okay, there's frame one, frame two, frame three, maybe frame n or something. And then we can say, okay, there's x, y, and then time goes this way let's say, and of course that's not even a right-handed coordinate system, we might want to maybe go the other way to get the coordinates to be a right-handed system with time out, if you will. But in either case, you're going to have this problem of trying to draw it and understand it when it's really, we think, I, I, I don't know, we often think in two dimensions a little bit easier than three or four dimensions. And so, I consider this idea of flatland to make this concept really simple because I want to teach the concepts in a really simple way. And I came up with this kind of way of teaching it. And actually, Bertolt Horn 
uh, the father of computer vision. He invented computer vision. He really liked my way of presenting this material and he used some of my thinking in his teaching. And so this, I took his course and I loved it. It was fantastic. And, and so this is, and Horn and Schunk is really your reference. Like Bertolt Horn is kind of the, the father of all of this. So you might want to like read some of his work if you're a uh, deep into understanding it. Book called Robot Vision from MIT. Now, let's consider a, a flatland and a one dimensional universe, a one dimensional image and two dimensional world. So the world is two dimensional. It has X and Y axes, and all the creatures that live in that world are flat. There's actually a science fiction book called Flatland that's written of this two dimensional world in which all the creatures living in this world are, are flat, two dimensional. And in Flatland, photographs are one dimensional functions. So in, normally we go from XYZ to XY when we take a photograph. But here in Flatland, we're going to go from XY, which is your reality, into just functions of one. So this is a mapping from R2 onto R1, let's say. And so in Flatland, movies are two-dimensional functions. So in our world, movies are X, Y, T, sort of uh, three-dimensional. And But in Flatland, movies are two-dimensional things look, look, look like this. And there's a function of x in time. So there's these one-dimensional pictures that appear in sequence. And if you want to play in flatland, just take the center row or the center column down the center of an image and plot a graph of it. And it's really insightful, I think, to, to do that and look at plots of things that are in images and, and understand them. And so in flatland, we're going to say that, that we've got some subject matter. And let's say there's, there's uh, Point T equals one here. There's something here and something here and something here. And let's say there's an object that's moving in flat land. Maybe there's this orange colored object here and it moves over to here and then over there it moves over to here. And there's some green grass over here like this. And then it's like this. Maybe there's a little bit of blue here or something, and it appears here, and it appears here. And what you can see is that everything's kind of moving in that image. And, and so what we can say from just pure observation of what we're seeing here is that we can say, say, E is the field. Uh, and say e of x t. Let's say this is x and this is t. I'll just pick some arbitrary uh, point here. Say this is x t instead of x and y. We've got x t coordinates. And so e of x t is is the field value at this point right here. And then let's say what we're going to claim or assert is that e of x t equals e of x plus delta x comma t plus delta t. Now, can everybody see the rightmost end? Can everybody see that closing bracket there? Let me just go back to the chat. So when you're viewing on your JIT, make sure the aspect ratio Make sure the aspect ratio of your um, <coughs> of your uh, jitsi or whatever it is 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 sized appropriately so that so that you'll see. Um, make sure your your thing is is uh, sized so that you can see it properly. Make sure you can see the edges of the chalkboard. Now, this is just a statement of fact. This, this is, uh, let's say this is delta t, is this change in time here, is delta t, and this change in space 
is delta x. So this is what we call the space-time continuum. There's a continuity of space-time uh, that this object, this blue object here, at time t equals t0 or t1 or whatever, and then go to t2, say here. Uh, that object is the same object moved over, so it has the same color. So if we look at the RGB values, it might be 0, 0, 1, or it might be 0, 0, 0.9 or something that's quite blue here, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0.9, or whatever it might be. In the, or here it's going to have approximately the same pixel values at that point in the image because it's at that same point. It's the same object that's moved over. So this is just a statement of pure fact. Now we can take the right-hand side and expand it as a Taylor series. If we expand the right-hand side as a Taylor series, we're going to take both of these sides are equal to the Taylor series of the right-hand side, which is we can say E of x plus delta x t plus delta t equals E of x t plus E x delta x plus E t delta t. E sub x is the derivative of this field with respect to x, and E sub t is the derivative of this field with respect to t. So this is dE by dt, the time derivative, and this is dE by dx, the space derivative. So what we have is that the field at the new point is equal to the field at the old point plus this, the uh, spatial derivative times e delta x plus the temporal derivative times delta t plus higher order terms. Now if you look at this, we can cancel these two things. e of x delta x. So we have We can cancel those things and say that that e x delta x plus e t delta t. So if you can say this is equal to this, so we can take. these two equal things here and take out take out this and this and say this here dx delta x plus et delta t plus higher order terms equals zero. Now if you look at what people have done here, you've got, you look at Wang and Adelson. Wang and Adelson and Horn and Chunk. Brutal Horn was also, you know, this uh, very, various different variations of this, of these concepts here called optical flow. And so what we, can, what we first say is UF equal flow velocity. Uf is flow velocity, and we're going to say divide both sides by delta t here. Divide both sides by delta t. We're going to have uex because this is delta x over delta t. So just let u 
velocity equals a change in time divided by the change, the change in space divided by the change in time. Delta T over delta X is how far it moved divided by how much time it took. So it might have units like meters per second or inches per second or miles per hour or something like that. So U E X, which is just delta X by delta T times E X plus E T because delta, delta T divided by delta T is just one plus higher order terms is zero, or we might just say that this is approximately zero. UEX plus ET is approximately equal to zero. What that means is that the velocity times the space derivative plus the time derivative is roughly equal to zero. And so that what we do is we take this error function and regularize that over the whole image plane or over the region that we're trying to analyze. And we say let this let this error epsilon equal sum over all the pixels, sum over all x of u m minus u f, where u m is the model velocity and u f is the flow velocity, all squared. So you're trying to minimize the, the squared error, and we'll say that is equal to the sum over x of u m plus e t over e x all squared and then we can put in a model for this say a, an affine model of y equals a x plus b or the transformation is, is an affine model a simple affine model and, and so we can put in there, okay, minus one, we want to take out the identity, x plus b plus dt over dx, whole squared. Now this gives us a way of saying we can go with the error, d epsilon by dA, and we can make down something there. It's going to be, you know, twice the sum of this, you know, whatever it is. And then d epsilon by db, which is the second one, is twice the sum of, you know, whatever it is. And then we, we take those, both of them, and set them both to zero. And then since the derivatives are both equal to zero, <coughs> we can take twos out and we just got the sum of this there's sum of something here is equal to zero sum of something else is equal to zero we've got two equations and two unknowns regular cross regular rights across the two images and then we just simply solve those then your solver affine set of equations and then we determine what the a and b are so given two images we can determine the a and b that relate the two images that is to say for example, we can determine the scale of those two images and the offset, gain the bias of the scale on the offset. So we can take two images, throw them into this algorithm, and out pops the numbers that, that provide the model fit. So we, we have model fit and flow. So take a look at that, chapter six, affine fit and affine flow. Uh, there's a couple of different work examples of different ways of doing it. And, and my own interpretation of, of uh, Wang and Adelson's work and my own interpretation of Horn and Schunk's work. And you can read their original work, but I like to add new value rather than just regurgitate what's already there. And so I've given my interpretation of the work of Wang and Adelson. Uh, I talk a lot to you, Professor. Yeah. I talked a lot to Professor Adelson uh, as well, and uh, and so when I was at MIT, I was good friends with him as well too. Still, you know, 
And this is really nice to kind of connect to the people who came up with this really great work. So these, these two people that I knew uh, very well uh, and worked with uh, are able to really connect and, and understand this, this content, this material in new ways. And then I went to extend upon this work and I defined something called projective fit and projective flow. And that's a new invention. And that's the orbits. And so that new invention um, is, is this, the, the orbits of the projective group. And that's, that's where you can actually get combined images together in, in, in these new ways by taking projective geometry, by, by sort of going right to algebraic projective geometry. And so if you look at, um, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to probably go to, let me see if I can, well, oh, I'm in this Jitsi. If I can, if I can go in here right in the middle of the Jitsi, can I, can I get into the app here for taking a picture? Just going to try to go to camera mode and so that work that early work that i came up with uh, on projective geometry projective fit and projective flow um, some of these ideas manifest themselves i want to take my shoes off so i will scratch the board and right up here and so now you should be able to see the camera here and you can probably see, so this function is an example of that video orbits type stuff. So now if I go here like this and start it, you turn this thing over a fixed center of projection like this. And if you keep the center of projection constant, the result is it makes a picture that's wider. It's stitched together all those images and made this wider view. Now the other case, the second example, is if I do this in translation. So the second example, if I take this thing and I move it parallel to the chalkboard. So I'm gonna go like this and I'm gonna hold it and I'm gonna move it parallel to the chalkboard. And I'm just moving it across the chalkboard like this. And that's the second example. So this is a type two panorama. The first one I did is a type one panorama. And this is a type two panorama. In the type two panorama, I just moved it parallel to the chalkboard. And if you want to do a type two panorama really well, you can even hold it on a structure like you slide it along a little rail, get a little rail, a piece of wood or something and slide this thing perfectly along and it'll image some other flat object. So a type one panorama, you can shoot anything you want. Type two panorama has to be a flat object to really render it properly. And I want to show you what I call a type three panorama. And a type three panorama is like this. We got it, we start tilting it. And then we'll start tipping it like, let's say, You start moving it like this, part of the way, and then the rest of the way slide. So a type three panorama is like where we start with the camera like this, and the camera goes, and we, we turn it around like this, and then we start sliding it along straight. So let's say if you have a flat subject matter, it works really well. And I love doing this with streetcars or building facades. Say there's a building facade here. You can look down the street like this, turn the camera like this, and then just walk or drive it along. If you're a passenger in a car, I call these drive-by shootings, where you turn the camera like this, and then let the car, so if you're at a red light, 
you turn the camera like this, and then as soon as the light turns green, it starts moving along like this, and that's called a type two panorama, or type three panorama. So you have like, this would be part of type three, which is a, a, a combination of type two and type one. It's partly type two and partly type, type one. So I, I, I want everybody to kind of get that fun idea that you can have fun and make these panoramas. Let me go back to here. So you can have a lot of fun that way. So anyway, this concludes my session. And, uh, um, and then, uh, yeah, let me know any thoughts and we'll, we'll call it, call it a day. And I'm off to the, to the beach for paddling if anyone wants to join up.